How many history majors are there in, in, the, in the group here? Oh, only four of you will admit it, huh? OK. Um, welcome to our first re regular lecture. Um, we're glad you're all here. I hope all of you got a sign-up sheet. And we're ready to get rolling with the series. Um, our first speaker is uh, Steve Bittner. He's uh, assistant professor of history. And um, on his website, he chose to tell you about himself. And he says he grew up in St. Joseph, Mich Michigan, uh, a small town on the southeastern shore of Lake Michigan. And I know where it is because I grew up in Chicago and spent some time in Michigan. So we've often had talks in the hall, not about history, but about St. Joseph and South Haven, and the Michigan, House of David. and the House of David. Um, he received his BA from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor in 1993. And um, after a brief stint as the director of a sailing school for children, uh, he went to the University of Chicago and pursued a PhD in Russian history. Before he came to Sonoma State, he was a visiting professor at Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania and a fellow at the Kenan, Kenan, George Kenan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies in Washington, D.C. He's lived for lengthy periods of time in Chicago, Washington, Moscow, and even Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> and he was never allowed to forget that he had been forever corruptible by the unspeakable university up north. I understand that there is a rivalry between the University of Michigan and Ohio State, right? That's right. <laughs> Just a small one. Go blue. Um, <laughs> He lives with his wife, Christel, and two children, Mia and Ethan, who are now four and two, in Santa Rosa. He's a wonderful colleague and a member of the Holocaust Faculty Advisory Committee uh, that helps us figure out what we want to do in the series. So without ado, I give you Steve Bittner. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. It is not often that I am introduced kindly. Uh, I wonder why that is. Uh, well, uh, what should I say about myself before I begin this lecture? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, if you haven't already realized by looking at the schedule for the next 15 weeks, uh, I am the least accomplished speaker uh, you will see this semester. Uh, I, as Myrna said, I went to a, a big public uh, research university, uh, University of Michigan, uh, and although I love Sonoma State and I, I love the fact that I've gotten to know so many of my students here, uh, I do miss the uh, Ann Arbor a lot and the environment of, of a big university a lot. And, and when I'm here at the Holocaust Lecture Series, uh, I can imagine that I am in Ann Arbor or Madison, Wisconsin, or Berkeley, or even Columbus, Ohio. Uh, that is, this is, this is the sort of thing you would find at a big uh, university, and it really speaks highly of Sonoma State that we have, have something like it. Uh, my, my second disclosure is even more important, uh, and that is I am not a historian of Germany. Uh, I am a historian of the Soviet Union. Uh, my uh, first book is, is about the Soviet Union. Uh, so I'm an outsider uh, to uh, the field that you have undertaken this semester. Uh, and uh, what that means is, is I may deflect questions, uh, and I hope there's time for questions at the end of, uh, at the end of class today, to, to Mirna or, or some of the other experts uh, uh, here in the front of the class. Uh, I, I don't know if this necessarily disqualifies me uh, uh, from commenting on the, on the Holocaust, though. I can say that in my own field, there's a German historian. His name is Jeff Eli, uh, who has, has figured very prominently in the way Soviet historians understand the Soviet Union. Uh, so I think oftentimes it helps to be an outsider. You, you, you notice things that, that insiders don't. 
Uh, and it also, because I'm an outsider, doesn't, doesn't mean that I haven't thought about, about the Holocaust. Um, uh, in fact, I've done so a great deal, primarily because there's so much uh, theoretical overlap uh, in the scholarship on Nazism and the scholarship on Stalinism, right? the, the contemporary, the Soviet contemporary uh, uh, to, to Nazism. And in particular, they're joined by this concept of totalitarianism. I'm curious, does anybody know what this means, totalitarianism? When a regime is described as being totalitarian, what, what does that mean? And, and I know none of your names, or very few of your names, so feel free to... Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a lot of, it means a regime that has totalizing ambitions, right? And, and you look familiar. I must have you in class, right? Yeah. What, what's your name? Barbara. Barbara, that's right, okay. Um, uh, and this is, you know, totalitarianism is a word, it's become a lot, or, or terrorism it has become a lot like totalitarianism. That is, it's a word that is used so often and in so many different contexts uh, that it has almost become devoid of meaning. And so people use it without consciously reflecting on what it means when you describe a, a political system like Nazi Germany or, or Stalinist Russia as being totalitarianism, as being totalitarian. In fact, totalitarian, uh, uh, totalitarianism was defined uh, about 50 years ago by, by two uh, political scientists at Harvard named Karl Friedrich uh, and Zbigniew Brzezinski. And the latter name may be familiar to you because he actually goes on to a career in politics uh, as Jimmy Carter's national security advisor uh, and as a CNN pundit. Uh, and I still occasionally see him on CNN. And they uh, came up with five characteristics that they thought you know, were sort of the emblematic traits of, of totalitarian regimes. And it's an all-encompassing ideology was one and monopoly on coercion, monopoly on press, um, uh, atomization of the individual, and then terror. Uh, and so these totalitarian regimes are terroristic. That is, they're capricious in their use of violence. And you never know uh, when the knock is going to come on your door and you're going to be arrested. And, uh, and, and so uh, um, Stalinism and Nazism are, are linked with this concept of, of totalitarianism. And, and so by default, I've had to, had to think quite a bit about, uh, about uh, Nazism and about the Holocaust. Stalinism and Nazism are also linked with the concept of genocide, uh, although less frequently and in my mind, I think less satisfactorily, because I don't think the Soviet Union was ever genocidal, uh, at least not in intent. Uh, it may have been in geno genocidal in, in outcome, but, but uh, it didn't intend to be. Uh, and I guess genocide is maybe like plagiarism. It's not a crime. It's not an accidental crime. I think like students don't accidentally plagiarize. Uh, I, I often have those students in my class who, or, or in my office who think they may have accidentally plagiarized, but it's it's a crime of intent. Um, and by the way, let me say that the comparison between Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia is one, I think, where the Soviet Union comes out looking quite good. Uh, and this is pretty rare. Whenever you compare the Soviet Union to any other state, it seems the you know, Soviet Union always suffers in comparison. Uh, but but the, the comparison between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union speaks to one of the great ironies of, of 20th century history. And that is that the Soviet Union, a communist country, a country that abhorred free market capitalism, saved the capitalist West from, uh, from its worst excesses. That is, the Soviet Union was the principal victor uh, in the struggle against Nazism. And, and this is always something that, that's hard for Americans to get a grasp of. We, we are uh, uh, you know, uh, acculturated in, in the, you know, Tom Brokaw's greatest generation. And, uh, we learn of the bravery of the, you know, the Americans who stormed the beach at Normandy. Uh, and this is all true, uh, but nevertheless, the Soviet Union bore the brunt of the casualties in World War II. Uh, the best estimate is that 27 million Soviet citizens uh, died in the war. About half of the people who perished in the Holocaust uh, were Soviet citizens. Um, uh, 
It is also true uh, uh, that the Holocaust was primarily an Eastern European event. Uh, and uh, as Americans, our, our image of the Holocaust tends to be one of Vichy collaborators. You guys know what Vichy France was, collaborationist France. Uh, and then Anne Frank holed up in, in her attic in, in Amsterdam, right? Uh, and, and certainly it is true that there were Jews in, in Western Europe who perished in the Holocaust, but the vast majority of, of Jews who perished um, resided in the East. And it was in the East where uh, the heartland uh, of, of European Jewry was located. And uh, in particular, it was the, uh, the old tale of settlement. Do we have any markers here? Can I use this? The Pale of Settlement. Uh, and the Pale of Settlement were lands, uh, I guess presently they would be in Ukraine and in Belarus. Uh, and according to Tsarist law, the laws of the Russian Empire, this is where Jews were, were allowed to live. Um, uh, and so this was, uh, uh, in terms of population, the largest Jewish population uh, in Europe on the eve of the Holocaust. And it's where most Jews perished. So the Holocaust was primarily an Eastern European event. Uh, so I think that qualifies me uh, at least a little uh, to speak about the Holocaust. Uh, if I were to ask you what the Holocaust was, I am confident that nearly all of you could answer. Uh, you, in fact, you, you probably wouldn't have enrolled in this class if you, you didn't know what the Holocaust was. You, you would tell me that the Holocaust was the, the process whereby German soldiers and political leaders and bureaucrats and thousands and thousands of non-German abettors planned and implemented the systematic murder of six million Jews uh, and smaller numbers of Roma. Who are the Roma? Gypsies, yeah, and how did gypsies get to Europe? Anybody know that? They actually came with the Mongolians when, when the Mongolians uh, invaded Russia uh, in the uh, 13th century. So smaller numbers of Roma, of Slavs, of handicapped persons, of homosexuals, and of communists also perished. Now as such, the Holocaust is the central event in all of German history. Uh, it is the central event in modern European history. It colors our understanding of what it means to be German, of what it means to be European. And, and it forces us to rethink the importance uh, of events as distant and, and as pivotal as the Enlightenment. Now, what was, what was the Enlightenment? I know some of you in here have taken History 202. And, and yeah, what's the Enlightenment? That's right. And generally, we, we can identify the Enlightenment with this period 1650 to, I guess, 1789. 1789 was the date of the French Revolution. The Enlightenment was this period of uh, uh, this great blossoming in, in political thought in Europe. The Enlightenment gave us uh, the American Republic. Uh, I will say something provocative here and then try to explain it later in my talk. The Enlightenment also gave us Auschwitz. So how can that be possible? Uh, and I will try to answer that today. Um, now, so, so you, could all answer, you could all tell me what the Holocaust was. But if I asked you why the Holocaust happened, I suspect you would find it much more difficult to answer. Uh, why did hundreds of thousands of seemingly normal persons they were normal, intelligent, and, and otherwise moral, participate in mass murder. And then why did millions and millions of others do nothing to stop it once it had begun? And uh, there's, there's a young historian of, of the Holocaust. He, he used to be at Harvard, but I think he was denied tenure. Uh, Daniel Jonah Goldhagen, was he denied tenure? Yeah. Uh, Harvard is cruel. 
as, as the young historian Daniel Jonah Goldhagen pointed out a few years ago, your answer to the question why the Holocaust happened would probably have as much to do with the nature of human existence, you know, what Joseph Conrad called the heart of darkness that, that supposedly exists in all of us, our capacity to commit uh, evil. Uh, so your answer would have as much to do with that than it would with the, the individual motivations of the, the persons who, who participated in murder. And I am not so naive as to think that I can answer this question, why the Holocaust happened. Uh, in fact, I am confident that in a hundred years, probably in this very auditorium, because Sonoma State will not have gotten enough money to renovate or to build a new auditorium, students will be asking the same question, why the Holocaust happened. It, it is one of these timeless questions that, uh, that will always be uh, central uh, in the historical field. Uh, but I do want to provide you today with a few conceptual tools uh, in the historical background that uh, uh, will make it possible for you to begin to formulate your own answer to this question, why the Holocaust happened. Uh, and in particular, I will identify three structural developments um, that in my mind facilitated the Holocaust. Uh, and, and then move on to the specific circumstances under which the Nazis came to power uh, in Germany in the 1930s. And then conclude by, by speaking broadly about how historians have made sense of the Holocaust. And there in particular, I, I think I'll, I'll draw upon uh, some of the uh, other expertise in this room. Okay, so uh, let's begin with the structural factors that, that facilitated the Holocaust. I think the first one has to be anti-Semitism. And uh, a few years ago, we had an Israeli uh, scholar speak in front of this group. His name was Yehuda Bauer. Uh, and in a, a very uh, uh, influential work, Yehuda Bauer argued that anti-Semitism is in fact a stupid term. Uh, it suggests, you, you know, the, this, this suffix ism, ism, uh, suggests that there's a doctrine, uh, uh, you know, there's some sort of Semitic doctrine that you can be opposed to. Um, uh, but there is no doctrine of, uh, you know, of Semiticness uh, that, that one can be opposed to. And, and also, Semite, uh, you, you know, a Semite is not only a Jew, but it would also be persons of Arab descent. Uh, so anti-Semitism, uh, you know, if we were going to, to understand it in a literal sense, would refer to animosity not only towards Jews, uh, but also towards other Semitic peoples uh, of the Mideast. Now, in some forms, anti-Semitism is as old as Christianity itself. Uh, many verses in the New Testament strike the modern reader as anti-Semitic. Uh, and they probably reflect tensions uh, in the early Christian church between Jews who converted to the new religion uh, and Jews who did not. Um, but uh, no doubt, as some of you know, uh, uh, much of Christian anti-Semitism hinges on the idea that Jews were responsible for the death of Christ. Uh, according to the book of John, Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor in, in Jerusalem at the time of Christ's death, was ready to pardon Christ, uh, but was convinced otherwise by a hostile Jewish crowd. Uh, according to the book of Matthew, Caiaphas, who was the Jewish high priest uh, in Jerusalem, helped fabricate evidence against Christ. Uh, although actually if you read a, a little bit more broadly, uh, 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 the book of Matthew suggests that, that Caiaphas fabricated evidence in order to stave off a, a, uh, a Roman military response. Uh, and of course, this is what got, got Mel Gibson in trouble, or one of the things got, that got Mel Gibson in trouble. And when I spoke in front of this class a year ago, I said there was some question, uh, a debate even, about whether the, the Passion of Christ was anti-Semitic, the film that, that Gibson made, uh, uh, and, and whether Mel Gibson was anti-Semitic. And I, I think one part of that debate has now been answered. Uh, uh, you know, what did the Romans say, in, in wine there is truth, is that what, in vino veritas? Uh, so you say what you really think when you're drunk, and, and indeed, uh, Mel Gibson said what he really thought. Um, uh, now, as a result, uh, until the 20th century, it was accepted doctrine in the Roman Catholic Church that Jews were responsible for the death of Christ. Uh, and this alone was often the cause of popular animosity uh, towards Jews in Europe. 
Uh, for instance, when the plague hit Europe in the 14th century, this was a, an absolutely, uh, uh, you know, an apocalyptic uh, event um, uh, that killed anywhere between a third and a half of, of the total European population. There were persistent rumors that, uh, that the plague was caused by Jews who had poisoned the drinking water. Um, there were also rumors uh, well into the, the late 19th century uh, in Europe that, that Jews used the blood of Christian children uh, when they prepared the, the Passover matzahs. Has everybody had a matzah in here? You guys know what a matzah is? Who knows what a matzah is? Yeah, what is a matzah? A matzah is a piece of unleavened bread like a big cracker. It can also be used as a frisbee. Uh, when I was in college, we often used them as frisbees. Uh, now, along with Muslims, Jews were targeted by the Crusades, you know, these, uh, these sort of military expeditions that went off to the Middle East in the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries uh, in order to free the Holy Lands. Uh, Jews were the, the objects of the Inquisition. What is the Inquisition? I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you speak up? Well, well, that was certainly one component of the Inquisition. The Inquisition was actually an office of the Roman Catholic Church that was charged with protecting uh, uh, orthodoxy or orthodox thought and sort of rooting out the heretics. Uh, and actually, the Inquisition still exists. Uh, it has been renamed uh, uh, something more benign uh, or benevolent sounding. In fact, the, the current pope um, uh, was formerly the, the head of the, the Inquisition. Uh, so the Jews were, the ob Jews were, were subject to the Inquisition. Uh, in the 12th and the 13th centuries, they were repeatedly expelled from France. Uh, they were expelled from Spain in 1492. What else happened in 1492? Yeah, so, so Columbus st uh, stumbles across the New World in the same year that the, the Jews are uh, expelled out of Spain. And by the way, this is how they, they, they happened upon the Pale of Settlement, is they, uh, you know, they left Spain and, uh, and headed for, for places where they were more welcome. Uh, Jews were expelled from parts of Prussia in the 1700s. Everybody know what Prussia is? That's Prussia with a P, not an R. Uh, Prussia is the precursor to the modern German state. Uh, it would uh, presently exist in northern Germany and northern Poland and even up into the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Uh, and, and in the Russian Empire, uh, where many displaced Jews moved after the Inquisition, they were confined, confined to residency to the Pale of Settlement uh, in, in Belarus and Ukraine. Uh, in large parts of Eastern Europe, Jews were forbidden from owning land. Uh, and, and this has given us this, the most pernicious of stereotypes, the, the Jew as the, the, the money changer, right? Or the, uh, and uh, uh, the reason for this is because Jews were forbidden from owning land as they had to make money through commercial activities because you couldn't farm. And that is how the vast majority of Europeans in the Middle Ages made their living. So, so Jews had to be entrepreneurial. Uh, unexpected or unexplainable tragedies frequently resulted in pogroms, this is a, this wonderful Russian word. Pa uh, makes it diminutive. And grom means thunder or storm. So a little storm, a, a sort of popular uprising against Jews. Uh, so anti-Semitism, in other words, has been with us for a very long time. Uh, but that does not mean that anti-Semitism is unchanging. In fact, over the course of the 19th century, uh, anti-Semitism changed in, in really important ways. Uh, basically, it became less religious in orientation and became more racial. So, so what does this mean and why did this happen? Well, it reflected two really important developments uh, in the lives of, of European Jews. Uh, first of all, Jews were becoming increasingly urban. Uh, uh, many were no longer practicing. Uh, men did not wear beards uh, in the yarmulke. In the Russian Empire, movement in and out of the Pale of Settlement was tolerated. So uh, big cities, Minsk, Moscow, uh, even St. Petersburg, there were sizable Jewish populations. Warsaw, some of you probably don't know this, Warsaw was also a city of the Russian Empire. Uh, 
presently capital of, of Poland. Uh, and then the switch from religious to racial anti-Semitism also reflected many pseudo-scientific theories that were in vogue in the late 19th century. Uh, and that attributed defining physical and mental characteristics to ethnic and racial groups. And uh, though we probably don't want to admit this, we all have heard of this before, right? I mean, Englishmen and Americans are individualistic. Germans are punctual. Irishmen are drunkards. Uh, and, and the list goes on and on. And uh, here I have a slide here where um, uh, you know, certain physical characteristics are being attributed to Jewishness. And uh, presumably this little boy standing here in front of the class is a model Aryan, a model German, and his teacher is showing him why he is not, not Jewish. Um, now Jews were associated with less savory characteristics. Uh, they were greedy, they were rootless, and they were cosmopolitan. Now what does this word mean, cosmopolitan? What did you say? Worldly, yeah, and if somebody says you're cosmopolitan, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's interesting that the sort of values of this have changed over the last hundred years. Uh, uh, but, but cosmopolitan, it means you're worldly. You're, you're a man or woman of the world. You're as at home in Paris as you are in Rio de Janeiro or New York City. Um, and uh, so, the, so cosmopolitan meant the same thing a hundred years ago as it does now, but the values were reversed. Jews supposedly had little loyalty for the nation. Uh, instead, they were, they were loyal to various transnational groups like the Jewish diaspora uh, or political movements like Zionism. Uh, and I'll talk about Zionism in, in a little bit. Or, or really, uh, crucially, Jews were also identified uh, as uh, advocates of communism. Uh, now, this, the, the association of Jewishness with cosmopolitan, I think, is really interesting. And, and I have a, a friend of mine at, at Berkeley, his name is, is Yuri Slozkin, has just written a, a very influential and provocative and controversial book called The Jewish Century. Uh, and, and he argues that insofar as cosmopolitan has become uh, one of the defining characteristics of what it means to be modern, Jews can understand to be the harbingers of modernity, like they brought us this, you know, this essential characteristic uh, of what it means to be modern. Uh, this book is called The Jewish Century, uh, about the 20th century. Now, now you may have noticed that, that there is in fact a, a contradiction here. How is it possible to be greedy on one hand and a communist on the other? Right? I mean, communists by definition are not greedy, right? You know, communists uh, have the interests of the the people, the working class at heart. Um, uh, so it would be oxymoronic, I think, to, to speak of a, of a greedy communist. Well, this is what uh, the soci sociologist Zygmunt Bauman, who is uh, on faculty at the University of Leeds uh, in England, calls the viscosity of, of Jewish identity. So, so Jewish identity, as perceived by, by anti-Semites, was always slippery. So Jews one day can be arch-capitalists, you know, uh, greedy money lenders. Uh, 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 the next day, they're, they're conniving Bolsheviks, you know, dedicated to the destruction of the capitalist regime and, uh, and, and the institution of uh, the creation of these atheistic uh, communist states. Uh, now, this is hardly an exhaustive list of the indignities that, that Jews have been subjected to over the last two millennia. Uh, and it is not, not meant to be an exhaustive list. But I, I do want to underscore a point that Jan Gross, a, a historian at NYU, made in, in a recent book on the way the Holocaust played out in, in a little Polish village called Yedwabny. Uh, and, and I won't spell that for you, and, and hopefully you won't be responsible for, for spelling that. Um, before the Holocaust, anti-Semitism, from the perspective of Jews, was a lot like an intractable, low-intensity war. Okay, so Jews, particularly in the East, had to be savvy to survive. Uh, a moment's carelessness, uh, you know, a, 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 a careless insult, uh, could produce a pogrom that would put the lives of yourself and your family at risk. But, but Gross's uh, point is that a, a low-intensity war uh, is survivable. 
Uh, in all but a few extraordinary cases, the Holocaust was not. Okay, so that's my first uh, structural factor that, that facilitated the Holocaust, anti-Semitism. Uh, my second structural factor is uh, uh, what I would call, I guess we could call nationalism. And so here we need to define a couple terms. What is a nation? If someone refers to a nation, what, what do they mean? Now, certainly we've all used this word. So what do you mean when you, you, you invoke the word nation? Yeah. A country with like a government. A country with a government. Yeah. So what's the difference between a nation and a state? Uh, a state is within a nation. State is within a nation, yeah. perhaps. Any other ideas on what what a nation is? Has broader uh, aspirations. try to give you a, a simple definition of nation. Nation is a group of people who perceive that they have something in common. And what they may have in common may be ethnicity, uh, it may be culture, it may be religion, uh, it could be uh, uh, you know, a creed. We're actually, the United States is probably a creedal nation, right? I mean, what makes Americans uh, is that we, we buy into these uh, beliefs that the founding fathers used when they, they wrote the Constitution. Um, but, but nonetheless, there's this perception that exists that a group of people share something in common. Uh, so uh, as Benedict Anderson said, uh, an uh, uh, important theorist of, of nations and nationalism, it's an imagined community. You need not know everyone in the group uh, who shares this same characteristic, but nonetheless you imagine that they have this characteristic and they also perceive it as being important and they also perceive themselves consequently as being a member of this group. Uh, so then what is nationalism? If a nation is a group of people that has something in common. So we add this ISM onto the end of it and, and what do we get? Yeah, patriotism can be part of it. Well, nationalism, uh, I think, to, to define it briefly, is a doctrine that holds that each nation should have its own state. And uh, uh, this has proven to be a remarkably seductive idea over the course of the last 200 years. Despite what nationalists say, um, and, and nationalists are very good at locating the origins of nations in the distant past. Uh, nations are actually relatively recent phenomena. Nations have only existed uh, for the last 200 years. Uh, many of the nations uh, in, in Eastern Europe are actually quite a bit younger than this. Uh, in Western Europe, the signal event for early nationalists was the French Revolution, which began in 1789. And, I guess we could say it probably ended in, in 1799 when, when Napoleon came to power. Uh, and the French Revolution is an important event because the French Revolution locates political sovereignty uh, in, in a broad citizenry rather than in, in a narrow aristocracy or, or in a royal family. That is, states rule on behalf of citizens and states are accountable uh, to citizens. Uh, in, in Central and Eastern Europe, where, where territories were incorporated into multinational empires like the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Russian Empire, um, uh, nationalism was shaped in important ways by a cultural movement called Romanticism. And, and I have to admit here, uh, if you're over at Safeway and you're, you're going through the checkout lane, you'll discover that I have an aunt, F. Roseanne Bittner, that writes romance novels. And she's had Fabio, you know, model for several of her, her covers, and it's all quite scandalous, and she makes a lot more money than I do. Um, uh, but that's not the sort of romanticism I'm talking about here. Uh, in the broadest sense, romanticism refers to a movement of art, uh, of thought, uh, of cultural sensibility broadly, 
uh, in which feeling and imagination uh, are stressed rather than science and rationality. Okay, so it's kind of a, a, a reaction to a world where uh, rationalism reigns supreme. Uh, and this idea, uh, you know, the rationality is very much a, a product of the Enlightenment. By, by the 1750s, the idea that the present was better than the past and the future would be better than the present, uh, you know, the idea of historical progress, um, this was firmly entrenched. Uh, in European thought by the, by the middle of the 18th century. And, and the French and the American revolutions actually contributed to this, right? I mean, they, they, they contributed to this by showing how people, subject people, could throw off chains of bondage and create more just and fair political um, systems. Now, Romanticism was a reaction to this growing confidence in, in man's ability to perfect his surroundings. Um, romanticism expressed deep anxiety uh, about the extent and pace of change, social, social and cultural change. Uh, romanticism was skeptical of science. Uh, uh, in, in fact, uh, I think if I were an American historian, I, I, would, I would write about uh, religious fundamentalism because it seems to me that uh, religious fundamentalism uh, has, has much in common with, with romanticism. Uh, uh, romant romanticism was skeptical of the claim uh, that man had mastered the, the secrets of the universe. Uh, and and it, it really portrayed uh, a, a sense of, of the vulnerability and the anxiety that beset modern man as, as all the gods of the past were torn down and, and replaced with new laws that were based on, on, on rationalism and, and science. Now, in Germany, uh, Romanticism gave rise to, uh, I guess we could, uh, a sort of individual we could call the Romantic Nationalist. Uh, and, and there's really two of these guys that, that you should know about. Uh, one is the poet Johann Herder, that's H-E-R-D-E-R. -E and the other is the composer uh, uh, Richard Wagner, uh, W-A-G-N-E-R. Uh, is any, anybody in here a, a music person? Play Wagner's music? Uh, it, well, both of these guys, Herder and, and Wagner, celebrated folk culture um, uh, as the only constant uh, in, in a sea of change. So in folk culture, Herder and, and Wagner located the kernel of what was supposedly the authentic national self. Uh, uh, and they argued that, that this authentic national self was immutable. It hadn't changed in centuries and centuries and centuries. So if you wanted to see what, you know, what was authentically German, you didn't look for that in Berlin. You went out to the countryside and, and went into some village where there wasn't electricity and where there wasn't running water and where no one knew how to read. Uh, and there you would discover what was authentically German. Uh, and uh, the nation, and this is where it gets really interesting, the nation was supposedly unified because it shared in this immutable cultural patrimony. Now, th there's an irony here. And the irony is that romantic nationalists were often cosmopolitans. They were, they were worldly intellectuals who spoke many different languages. Uh, but nonetheless, they idealized the lives of, of illiterate peasants uh, as somehow being more authentic than, than their own. Um, now, as, as a political doctrine, uh, nationalism was and, and remains one of the most successful of all time. Uh, over the course of a hundred years, Europe ceased to be a continent of empires and became a continent of nation states. That is, nations that had their own states, so where the nationalist dream had been achieved. Uh, so states that based their legitimacy uh, to exist on the will of the nation. Uh, and let me just run through a list here. Serbia gained its independence in 1815. It actually would later give up its independence in 1918 to join uh, uh, what was the precursor to, to Yugoslavia. So Serbia, 1815. Greece in 1829. Romania in 1859. Italy in 1861. Germany in 1870 and 1871. 
Bulgaria in 1878, Albania in 1912, Czechoslovakia in 1918. And that's actually a, a peculiar case because Czechoslovakia is a state comprised of two nations, the Czechs and the Slovaks. Uh, and, and when does that fall apart? When, does, when did the Czechs and the Slovaks go their different ways? Some of you were alive during this event. Uh, this happened right after the, the collapse of communism uh, in 1989. Uh, Poland gained its independence in 1918. Latvia in 1918. Lithuania in 1918. Estonia in 1918. Hungary in 1918. Ukraine in 1918 and 1919, but then Ukraine is, is uh, incorporated into the Soviet Union, so they gain it and then lose it. Uh, and then Turkey uh, in 1923, the modern Turkish state. Uh, so this is all fine and good, right? And, and we, can, we see a lot of uh, Woodrow Wilson in this all, right? I mean, national self-determination, the end of World War I produced all these new nations. But it also caused problems. Uh, and uh, the borders that were drawn between nation states were rarely perfect. Romanians lived in Russia, Ukrainians lived in Poland, Germans lived in Czechoslovakia, Turks lived in Bulgaria, and millions and millions and millions of Europeans lived outside what was their titular nation state. And uh, I passed out a, a sheet here that gives you um, uh, some sense on how uh, uh, convoluted things were, uh, both in terms of Jews, uh, uh, you know, what Jewish populations were in, in some of these European states, but then also what uh, German populations were outside of, of Germany. Uh, and Jews, I, I should mention Jews here, uh, Jews uh, had a nationalist ideology Zionism, but they did not have a state. Now, now what is Zionism? Surely we, we've all heard of Zionism before, right? What, what does that mean when somebody says you're a Zionist or says, oh, that's Zionism? That's right. Uh, Zionism is, is, a, is a political ideology that was born out of the cafes of Venice, or not Venice, uh, uh, Vienna, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, the, the really important figure here was a journalist named Theodor Herzl, H-E-R-Z-L. Uh, uh, -E uh, um, and Zionism was the nationalist movement of Jews, so the, you know, the attempt to find a homeland for Jews. And of course, this nationalist movement realized itself after the war, uh, after the Second World War with the, the creation of the State of Israel. Uh, okay, so that's the second structural factor, I think, that, that, that facilitated the Holocaust, the rise of nations and the rise of nationalism. The third uh, is militarism. By 1870, every major European power maintained a standing army. What is a standing army? That's right, that's right. So and this is actually rather novel. It used to be that you know, when a state had to raise an army, uh, you know, they conscripted people, they went off and fought, and then they came home and they all went their own way. But the army was not something that permanently existed. Uh, by 1870, this has changed, and, and every European power maintains a standing army. Uh, they also are spending increasing sums of money on weapons production, uh, military spending doubled in France between 1875 and 1914. It tripled uh, in Britain and Germany. By, uh, in Russia, by 1914, the military accounted for a full one-third of the state budget. Now, now, as a point of comparison, anybody know what it is here uh, in the United States? It's too bad Peter Phillips isn't here anymore, because he would know. This year. Yeah, and what percentage of the total budget is that? The total budget is 2.9 trillion. And it's about yeah, well, it's about a half of discretionary spending. You know, most money Congress spends is, is not discretionary. That means it's fixed. It goes 
to programs that Congress has no control over. But the military comprises about half of discretionary funding. I, I think it's, it was about a sixth of the total, a fifth of the total uh, budget overall. Uh, on the eve of World War I, there were some 19 million men in uniform uh, on the European continent. And really, military values and military thinking had, had uh, begun to pervade European societies more broadly. Uh, technology al also spurred the arms race. Uh, the French introduced the machine gun uh, in the 1860s. Uh, new industrial processes made possible uh, uh, the development of far larger and more accurate artillery. Uh, by 1914, the Germans had artillery that could launch a shell 75 miles. So they could uh, you know, be in Belgium or in France and, and essentially hit London. Uh, iron bottoms revolutionized naval warfare. Uh, by the early 1900s, uh, the European powers are producing battleships, you know, which are nothing but big ships with artillery uh, fixed to their decks. Uh, but more importantly, the very idea of violence had become culturally accepted. Uh, and if you look at the political spectrum, on the left and on the right, Marxists on the left, social Darwinists on the right, liberals in the middle, everybody thought that struggle between peoples uh, was historically necessary. Uh, and, and it was unavoidable. Uh, and, and jingoism, this is a wonderful word, jingoism. Uh, which it refers to a, a bellicose form of, of nationalism or patriotism. Jingoism became the approved standard of, of patriotic expression. Now, now, this enthusiasm for violence was manifested in extremely low desertion rates when the European powers actually went to war in World War I. Uh, the French command estimated that desertion rates could be as high as 13%. Uh, in fact, uh, they proved to be about one and a half percent. So across these societies, there's a, a, you know, a, a willingness to use violence to achieve political goals. Okay, so those are my three factors, I think, that, that, that sort of set the stage for, for the Holocaust. Are there, are there any questions on that before I move on? Okay, well, let's talk about what happened to uh, the computer. Wasn't there a photo up there before? What's that? Oh, screen save. So what do I have to do? Control Alt Delete. Do you have a keyboard up there? No. Can I give you this keyboard and just ask you to, to go? Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's move on then to how the Nazis uh, actually came to power. Uh, Nazi success was actually built upon the failures of, of German liberalism. And this word also means something very different uh, in, in, the, in the context of, uh, of Germany in the 1920s uh, than, than America in, in uh, the early 21st century. Liberalism, uh, as is classically defined, refers to regimes that uh, respect the sanctity of the free market. Okay? And this is confusing for us as Americans because the party that claims to be liberal uh, in, in American politics, the Democrats, is actually not the heir to classical liberalism. The Republican Party is actually a closer uh, uh, offshoot of, of classical 19th century free market liberalism. So, so Nazi success was built on the failures of German liberalism, in particular the failures of what was called the Weimar Republic. Uh, in Weimar, that's W-E-I-M-A-R. In, in Weimar uh, was a city uh, uh, in the eastern part of Germany where the new German constitution was drafted uh, at the end of World War I. And the Weimar Republic lasted until 1933. Uh, and it was arguably during this period the world's most democratic state. Uh, it really was a, a remarkable thing. Uh, but it had many weaknesses. Uh, and one of the weaknesses, and, and probably the one that, that we all know about, is the, the onerous reparations of the Treaty of Versailles. You know, despite what Woodrow Wilson said, that is victory without defeat, uh, the French and the British insisted on, on, on reparations, and these really uh, uh, hurt the German economy. Uh, but equally important was political polarization. 
between the left and the right uh, in Weimar. Uh, for instance, on November 9th, 1918, the day German liberals proclaimed the formation of the Weimar Republic, uh, German socialists uh, proclaimed the formation of a pro-Soviet republic. Uh, uh, so there were, this is quite remarkable, right? I mean, uh, uh, you know, the, on the very same day, we have the, the, the proclamation of a German liberal republic and a German socialist republic. Uh, and of course, the liberals win out, uh, but there are right-wing uprisings in 1920 and 1923 that capitalized on popular disenchantment with the economy. Uh, but then, really pivotally, uh, the event that, that sunk Weimar uh, was, was the Great Depression. Uh, in October of 1929, or excuse me, the summer of 1929, the American economy slipped into recession. Uh, in October, uh, the New York Stock Exchange collapsed. And, and within weeks uh, after uh, the American collapse, Europe collapsed as well. Uh, and after the crash, American financiers were, were no longer able to, to offer loans uh, to Weimar uh, into the European economies. And, and uh, by 1932, American investment in Europe had fallen by 70%. Uh, and, and this is really crucial because Weimar needed that influx of capital from the United States in order to pay war reparations. And, and so not surprisingly, Germany was really the first state to experience political upheaval uh, in, in the wake of the Great Depression. In parliamentary elections in September of 1930, German voters stunned the pundits by handing 107 seats it was about one-sixth of the total number of seats, to a party no one had ever heard of before. It was called the National Socialist Party, the Nazis. Uh, and overnight, the Nazis went from being an inconsequential party to comprising the second largest bloc in the German parliament. The German parliament is called the Reichstag. Uh, so the Nazis, in other words, were really the prime beneficiaries of, of uh, the mounting economic crisis uh, in Germany. Uh, now, we know the Nazis were led by, by Adolf Hitler. Uh, Hitler was born in Austria in, in 1889. Um, as a young man, he dabbled as a painter, um, but was denied admission to the Academy of, of Fine Art in Vienna. Uh, this raises all sorts of interesting, uh, uh, you know, counterfactual historical questions. Uh, you know, how might history have turned out differently if only Hitler had been uh, allowed to matriculate at the Academy of Fine Arts, but, but he wasn't. Uh, uh, Hitler served with the German infantry in World War I. Uh, he twice received the Iron Cross uh, for being wounded in, in poison gas attacks. And after the war, Hitler joined the Nazi Party, the National Socialist Party. And socialist here is not meant to be understood in the Marxist sense. Uh, uh, you know, it doesn't refer to some you know, greater social good uh, that's being realized by the workers rising up uh, against the, the capitalist oppressors. It refers to this feeling of solidarity that supposedly existed among German veterans who had served in World War I. Uh, in 1923, Hitler was arrested for participating in a coup against the Bavarian government in the city of Munich. Uh, and the coup plotters were actually caught before any real damage could be done. And, and Hitler was sentenced to nine months in prison. And it was while Hitler was in prison that he wrote what would become the Bible of the Nazi movement, uh, his autobiography called Mein Kampf, or My Struggle. And in Mein Kampf, Hitler laid out his view of history. Uh, and rather than seeing history as a product of class struggle, you know, this is how Marx envisioned it. Marx thought that, that class struggle was the engine of history. It's what drove history along. It's what caused wars. It's what won presidential elections uh, and so on. Hitler claimed that, that history was very different. His, history was the product of struggle between the races. Okay. And the master race, according to Hitler, uh, was the Aryans. Uh, and the Aryans were the, the predecessors to the Germans and the Brits. Uh, and the Aryans were supposedly ordained by God uh, to be the implacable foe of lesser peoples. And in particular, Hitler had in mind Jews, 
uh, but also the Slavs, uh, who I guess were just one step up the racial hierarchy that, that Hitler created from, from the Jews. Now, according to Hitler, Germany had to adopt an aggressive foreign policy uh, in order to realize its historical destiny. Uh, and he thought that Germany had to conquer essential uh, living space, Lebensraum, uh, in the east, uh, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, so Germans could settle it and, and have baby Germans and, and, and so on. And, and Hitler knew that this expansion would, would anger France, um, which was uh, Germany's traditional ally uh, in Europe. But, but he thought that Britain would never, uh, would never send any troops to the continent to stop it. Of course, he, he gambled wrong here, right? I mean, this didn't prove, turn out to be the case. But he thought that the British, because of a long history of, of isolationism and a belief that they were safe on their island, wouldn't want to intervene. But he also probably put too much stock into the fact that the, the, the Anglo-Saxons uh, and the Germans shared ancestors. And, and that didn't mean a whole lot to most, most British. The British were Aryan, but, but didn't really care about it. Uh, now, so these were the core elements of, of, of Nazism. Racial superiority on one hand, the racial superiority of Germans on one hand, and the need for expansion on the other. Okay, so how exactly did Hitler come to power? Well, he came to power almost by accident. Despite the impressive showings of, showing of the Nazis in 1930s, uh, they, they still played, excuse me, in 1930, they still played second fiddle to what was the largest uh, party in German politics, the Social Democratic Party. And this is a party which was just left of center. Uh, uh, and by 1932, the Nazis had become the strongest party in numeric terms, but they were still far from a majority. They controlled only 230 of the 611 seats in the Reichstag. Uh, and, and moreover, in 1932 and 1933, there's even some evidence that suggests that, Nazi, that popular support for the Nazis was waning, and it was shifting to the communists. Uh, and this is proof, I think, that, that the political spectrum, which we frequently imagine as left-right, is actually a circle. And if you go far enough right, you start to come back left. And if you go far enough left, you start to come back right. Uh, and so people who, who found something they could identify in the Nazis also saw something they could identify with in the communists, even though they came to uh, claim to be implacable foes of each other. Uh, uh, so the Nazi phenomenon, if you were in, in Berlin at the end of 1932, you could say with some certainty that the Nazi phenomenon seemed to be fading. Uh, now, ironically, the Nazi seizure of power can be, attributed in, can be attributed in part to the commitment of centrist parties, particularly the Social Democrats, to maintaining uh, you know, many of the ideals that we associate with a liberal democratic state. Uh, and let me be a little more specific here. In 1932, the German chancellor tried to convince the German president to ban both the Nazi and the Communist parties, you know, to outlaw them. And the German president refused because he saw it as a violation of certain core liberties, right? The freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly. Uh, and certainly the Nazis were odious, but they did have these rights and they could not be easily taken away from them. But clearly something had to be done to constrain the Nazis. And the solution seemed ingenious at the time, uh, but in retrospect, it backfired. Uh, and the solution came in January of 1933, when, when the German president, Paul von Hindenburg, offered Hitler the chancellorship. And as chancellor, Hitler would rule over a coalition cabinet that would contain only three Nazis among its 11 seats. And the chancellorship was essentially the head of government. This is a, a sort of European model where executive power, the presidency, is split from government power. Uh, the French ha have something very similar. Uh, and in the eyes of Hindenburg, once in power, Hitler would have to tone down his rhetoric and behave more responsibly. Uh, and this isn't an unjustified belief, right? I mean, oftentimes politicians behave irresponsibly when they're running for office and, and they, uh, they moderate their behavior once they're actually in power. 
Uh, in, in a sense, Hindenburg thought that Hitler would be little more than a puppet once he was in power who could be easily controlled by mainstream parties. Now, can you go ahead one slide here? And so here we have this day in, in January 1933 where Hitler is brought into, uh, uh, into, uh, into government as chancellor. Uh, and this is right after the agreement was struck. Now, now once Hitler uh, was in power, he moved quickly to consolidate uh, his position. He immediately demanded that new elections be held to the Reichstag, the German parliament. Uh, and these elections were scheduled for March of 1933. But on February 27th, 1933, the Reichstag burned down. The parliament building burned down. And we know now, in retrospect, that the fire was probably set by a Nazi arsonist. But Hitler blamed the communists. And in the days that followed the fire, um, uh, thousands and thousands of communists were arrested. Uh, and the German president, Paul von Hindenburg, uh, issued a decree, an emergency decree, which suspended individual liberties. And in the following day, Nazi thugs terrorized their political opponents. And this really set the stage for a Nazi uh, electoral triumph when the elections actually occurred on, on March 5th. And the Nazis won 44% of the vote. Now, still not a majority, but they had allies. There was a, a nationalist party that was sympathetic to, uh, to the Nazis. And so with the help of the nationalist party, Hitler could claim a majority of the seats in the, in the Reichstag. Now, less than three weeks later, less than three weeks after these elections, the Reichstag approved what was called the Enabling Act. Uh, by the way, uh, some of you probably follow Venezuelan politics. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Hugo Chavez uh, issued something called the Enabling Act. Uh, I don't know if the, the parallel, if the press picked up on the parallel. Uh, so the Reichstag approved the Enabling Act, and, and this authorized the government to rule by decree without the approval of, of the Reichstag. So essentially the Reichstag had just decreed itself out of existence uh, by, by approving this, this enabling act. And Hitler became a dictator, even though he never received the support from the, the majority of the German population. So 44% was the peak uh, of, of Nazi electoral support. Now two factors made the Nazi expansion so rapid. First of all, the, the Nazis did not hesitate to use violence uh, against their political foes. Uh, they used, uh, at first, the, the institution was called the Gestapo, the secret police, uh, and later during the war it was renamed the SS, uh, which is an acronym. And, and secondly, thousands of bureaucrats and state officials joined the Nazi party because they saw it as a way to advance their careers. Now, the traditional institution that was most likely to give Hitler uh, uh, problems was the army. And it's it pretty clear that the, the army leadership basically thought that Hitler was, uh, was dangerous and they had little respect for him. Uh, but of course, military support was absolutely essential for this uh, aggressive foreign policy that, that Hitler wanted to adopt. So what did Hitler do? Uh, on June 30, 1934, Hitler accused army generals of homosexuality and he ordered the SS to assassinate them. And this became known as the Night of Long Knives. So June 30, 1934, the night that German, German army generals were assassinated. Uh, five weeks after this, um, which would put us in August of 1934, uh, Hindenburg, the German president, died of natural causes, and Hitler united the offices of chancellor and president. Uh, he occupied both. Now, effective opposition to the Nazis also might have come from Christian churches. Uh, the Nazi electoral triumph in 1933 was made possible by support from Protestant voters, from middle-class Protestant voters. Uh, it, but nonetheless, most Protestant clergymen tried to maintain uh, uh, some sense of, of political neutrality or distance from the Nazis. A very small number of Protestant clergymen formed an active underground opposition movement uh, to the Nazis. 
and the, the most famous case here is a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, who perishes uh, in the camps uh, during the war. In fact, uh, Bonhoeffer was one of about 800 Protestant clergymen uh, who perished in the camps. Now, in 1933, Hitler signed a treaty with the Vatican, uh, and the pope at the time was Pope Pius XI. Uh, and, and Pius gave his stamp of approval to the Nazis uh, in return for, for a promise that the Nazis would recognize the traditional confessional liberties that Catholics had, had enjoyed uh, in Germany for quite some time. And this is important because it essentially undermined the ability of one of the, uh, the other political parties in, in German politics, it's called the, the Catholic Center Party, to oppose Hitler because the Pope had just signed a, a, an alliance with Hitler. Uh, and whatever the case, Hitler's assurances to the papacy proved to be largely worthless. In, in the mid-1930s, the, the Nazis uh, ruthlessly attacked Catholic schools and Catholic youth groups, so, so Hitler did not live up to it to his end uh, of the bargain. And eventually, Pope Pius XI decided that the 1933 pact was a mistake. Uh, in 1937, he issues a document, it was called an encyclical, um, uh, that attacked uh, totalitarianism in Nazi Germany. And, and the title of this document was called With Burning Sorrow. Uh, and of course, by this time, you know, Pope Pius realized he had made a mistake, but by this time, uh, uh, Nazism was firmly entrenched. And it's interesting that, that, that Pope Pius attacked Nazi totalitarianism, but he did not attack Nazi anti-Semitism. Uh, and I'll speak a, a little bit more about this uh, in a little bit. And, and there, this is one of these issues that has received a, a great deal of attention in, in recent years among historians. There are some historians who think at, at best Pope Pius turned uh, a blind eye to the suffering of, of millions and millions of Jews. Uh, there are other historians who have argued that Pope Pius actively abetted uh, in the destruction of the European Jewry by sanctioning anti-Semitism among European Catholics. Okay, uh, we know Nazi racism uh, was, was directed primarily against Jews. In 1933, after coming to power, Hitler expelled most Jews from the German government. Uh, two years later, in 1935, he issued the infamous Nuremberg Laws. And this is probably one of these things that you definitely need to know. By the end of this semester, you have to know what the Nuremberg Laws were, and I see Mirna's nodding her head, so I think that's a yes. Uh, and so what were the Nuremberg Laws? Well, the Nuremberg Laws uh, denied German citizenship to persons with two or more Jewish grandparents. The Nuremberg Laws prohibited marriage and sexual intercourse between Germans and Jews. Uh, the, German, the Nuremberg Laws required Jews to wear the yellow star of David in public. Uh, it allowed German towns to refuse residency to Jews, and it allowed German businesses to fire Jewish employees. Now, by 1938, as a result of these Nuremberg laws, about 100,000 German Jews had fled abroad. And of course, if they were lucky, they fled uh, to areas that would not later be occupied, to the United States or to Switzerland. But unfortunately, many of these people fled to other parts of Europe that were later occupied by the Nazis, and, th and then they were caught up in the Holocaust nonetheless. On November 8th of 1938, the, Nazi, uh, the Nazis subjected those Jews who re remained to an event called Kristallnacht, uh, the Night of Broken Glass. And can you go ahead? Uh, uh, and uh, on this night, November 8, 1938, scores of Jews were killed, thousands were dragged from their homes and beaten out in the streets, 200 synagogues were burned, 7,000 Jewish businesses were destroyed. Uh, you can go one more slide ahead here. Uh, Hitler's government blamed uh, Jews for the disturbances, strangely enough, and about 25,000 Jews were incarcerated because of their behavior on the night of Kristallnacht. Uh, and, and, uh, and many of these people found themselves in, in concentration camps. Uh, they were also, Jews were also forced to pay for, the, for much of the damage uh, that was incurred on, on Kristallnacht. Now, these, earlier, these early attacks are significant because they're part of what we can call the, uh, the disemancipation 
phase uh, of, of Nazi uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, and and I, if we put this in the context of, of what we've already talked about, you know, what Jan Gross called the intractable war of, of anti-Semitism, I don't think they're necessarily in consonant with, with the intractable war. Uh, you know, the disemancipation phase was survivable. But what was, what was uh, so unique about, the Nazi, uh, about Nazi anti-Semitism is that this was not enough. And then in the end, genocide uh, was, the, was uh, uh, the only way the Nazis could eradicate uh, the European Jewry. Now, Hitler, of course, wanted uh, Lebensraum, living space in the East. Uh, and uh, according to his advisors, this would require the annihilation of about 30 million Slavic persons. So Russians and Poles and Belarusians and Ukrainians. Uh, and the Nazis already regarded these people as subhuman. Uh, and to, uh, to facilitate this annihilation, uh, uh, the Nazis uh, authorized special SS action teams uh, to travel through occupied territories in Eastern Europe uh, and to slaughter at will. Can you go ahead a slide? Uh, these were called the Einsatzgruppen. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the war, when does World War, World war II begin? What is the date conventionally identified as the beginning of the war? Well, it's September 1st, 1939. Uh, and this is the day that according to the terms of the, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the pact that the Soviet Union signed with Nazi Germany, uh, that, that Germany was allowed to move into the western part of Poland. Two weeks later, on September 15th, uh, the Red Army occupied the eastern part of Poland. Uh, and this marked the beginning of World War II. Uh, behind uh, the soldiers were these Einsatzgruppen. Uh, they typically forced their victims, many of whom were Jews, to dig their graves uh, and then line up on the rim to be shot. Uh, millions of Soviet citizens died in this way. Uh, some 3.7 million Soviet prisoners of war uh, were executed uh, in this manner. Uh, now, of course, even lower than the Slavs uh, and on the Nazi racial uh, hierarchy were Jews. And Hitler was determined to eradicate as many of the 11 million Jews who lived in Europe as possible. Uh, soon after the outbreak of the war in September of 1939, Jews in Poland were herded into ghettos. Uh, first in the city of Lodz, that's L-O-D-Z, uh, but then later in Warsaw and in other cities. Uh, and it was from these ghettos that, uh, that Jews were sent to be killed uh, in concentration camps. But the ghetto was no picnic, uh, and, uh, and mortality rates by 1942 were hovering at around 20% per year. So one out of every five persons already interred in the ghetto would, you know, would die over the course of a year. Uh, can you go ahead, one more slide here? Uh, and here's a picture of the, from the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, and at first, these, these were supposed to be, uh, you know, temporary accommodations to, uh, to uh, segregate Jews from the rest of the population uh, while their ultimate fate was decided. And their ultimate fate was decided in July of 1941 when uh, uh, Hermann Göring, one of Hitler's uh, uh, commanders issued a fateful order that called for the mass murder of Jews. And you can actually go online and find this document and it reads, quote, a total solution of the Jewish question in the German sphere of influence in Europe. Uh, now the following January, January of 1942, Nazi leaders met in a Berlin suburb. Uh, the suburb was called Wannsee. Uh, to map out plans to deport Jews to camps that had been set up throughout Eastern Europe. Uh, and these camps were, were uh, equipped uh, to kill large numbers of people in, in a fairly efficient manner. And the Nazis had determined that, that shooting people was actually inefficient, and it took too much time, and it, it wasted resources. So the preferred method of killing was the gas chamber. Uh, and, uh, you know, after a person was killed in a gas chamber, dental fillings could be removed, corpses were burned, uh, fertilizer uh, was created from uh, the ashes of bones. Uh, um, uh, some corpses were boiled to produce soap. 
Uh, now, of course, the most notorious of these camps uh, was at Auschwitz. Can you go ahead, uh, a slide here, uh, in Poland. And, and Auschwitz was a model of German efficiency. You see here, I've just relied on one of those ethnic stereotypes, uh, German efficiency. Uh, Auschwitz was capable of, of killing 12,000 people a day. Uh, by the end of the war, Auschwitz alone was responsible for the murder of about two and a half million persons in gas chambers, and another half million through barbaric treatment, essentially slave labor. Uh, one more slide here. Uh, now, the Nazis plan to exterminate uh, 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 inferior peoples also included gypsies, it included Jehovah's Witnesses, it included homosexuals, it included the mentally ill. Uh, between 1938 and 1941, the Nazis actually perfected their gassing techniques on about 70,000 mentally ill Germans. Uh, uh, and, and in time, German scientists perfected a form of cyanide that upon exposure uh, to air created a gas. It was called Zyklon B. Uh, but even at its most efficient, uh, this, this process of killing took about 15 or 20 minutes. So, you know, from the moment you were exposed to the moment of death was, was 15 or 20 uh, agonizing minutes. Now, at first, uh, Allied and Jewish leaders were uh, absolutely incredulous at these reports of genocide that were filtering out of uh, Eastern Europe. But even when these reports were confirmed, there was no attempt made to, to bomb either the camps or the railroads that led to the camps. Uh, although underground church groups, and mainly Protestant ones, uh, assisted the Jews, Pope Pius uh, XI and then Pope Pius XII, his successor, one pope dies in 1939 and he's replaced by Pope Pius XII, uh, they never condemned the atrocities, uh, even when Jews were herded into cattle cars uh, in the middle of Rome and deported to death camps. Uh, it's certainly the case that there was scant sympathy uh, for Jews in Poland, especially among uh, Roman Catholic clergy that was bitterly anti-Semitic. Uh, there were instances of heroism. Uh, in, in fact, I think Myrna ha has written about some of this, the Danes, uh, the Hungarians, the Bulgarians, the Italians uh, all organized large underground resistance movements uh, that saved tens of thousands of Jews from, from murder. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the effort uh, to blame this all on a mere handful of, of deranged Nazi leaders is really indefensible uh, because there were tens of thousands of people who were directly complicit uh, in this murder. Uh, German soldiers, German politicians, French collaborationists, Polish clergy, uh, the list goes on and on and on. And, and few of these people were ever held accountable for their crimes. I mean, the trials at Nuremberg after the war were just a few of the most prominent persons. Uh, uh, most people got off scot-free. Um, okay, so, so how do historians think uh, about the Holocaust? Um, well, for several decades, uh, debate about the Holocaust centered on, on school, two schools of thought. Uh, and, and these schools are called the intentionalist school on one hand and the functionalist school on the other. So in, intentionalist versus functionalist. Uh, and and what, what exactly do they think? Well, the intentionalists have argued that the Holocaust was the product of Nazi willfulness. So the roots of the Holocaust could be found in the origins of the Nazi party, uh, in Hitler's Mein Kampf, right, his autobiography, uh, in the Nuremberg Laws. Uh, so in other, in other words, the Nazis had a master plan from day one to destroy the Jews, and they acted on it, and they succeeded. Uh, the functionalist argument is different. The functionalists deny that there was a master plan, although they recognize that there was deep anti-Semitism, both among Nazi leaders and among the German population. Uh, the functionalists argue that the Holocaust uh, was the product of a, spe a specific confluence of events. So then they tend to emphasize rivalries in the bureaucracy uh, rather than the ambitions of, of political leaders. 
so, so this debate raged uh, for several decades, and, and I think it has quieted in recent years. And, and, and historians have begun to look beyond the, the functionalist, intentionalist divide. Uh, 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 and partly this is, is made possible by different sources that have become available. But I already men mentioned Daniel Jonah Goldhagen. Uh, there's a historian at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, named Christopher Browning. Uh, who along with Goldhagen has looked at, at individuals who participated in the Holocaust and tried to ascertain why they, they, why they participated uh, in murder. Uh, Jan Gross, this historian I mentioned at, um, uh, at uh, NYU, uh, ha has even gone so far as to question the centrality of German soldiers in the actual act of murder. And, and this, this case, this Polish village he investigates is quite... One of the reasons why it's quite remarkable is the Germans actually step back uh, and, and let the Poles themselves do the killing. In fact, the Germans were actually quite surprised uh, at the extent of, of anti-Semitism that already existed uh, in this, this Polish village. Uh, and, and then this, this sociologist I mentioned earlier, Zygmunt Bauman, places the Holocaust uh, uh, within broader trajectories of, of modernization. Uh, and Bauman, in particular, sees the Holocaust as being a product of, of the Enlightenment. And, and uh, you know, I said uh, uh, about an hour ago that the Enlightenment gave us uh, the American Republic. It also gave us Auschwitz. The Enlightenment give, gave us the idea that human existence can be perfected. And uh, it gave us a new type of state, what Bauman calls the gardening state. So a state that is committed to gardening its population. So cultivating some parts of the population and weeding other parts of the population. The American state is very much a gardening state. Uh, some of you uh, undoubtedly are here on the GI Bill. That is, you served in the military and now the military will pay your way through college. Uh, our state uh, you know, protects the borders, although inefficiently. Uh, um, uh, so you know, our state gardens. Uh, Nazi Germany was an extreme manifestation of a gardening state. And of course the weeding, you know, the weeding out of undesirable parts of the population was done in, in a brutal manner. But, but, but nonetheless, I think what's so provocative about Bauman's work is he suggests that, uh, you know, the GI Bill and Auschwitz are two sides of the same coin. So that said, uh, uh, we have about 15 minutes, and I'd be happy to take any questions or, or defer, uh, even better yet, to defer questions to other people uh, in the auditorium. Uh, but, uh, but I am done. So. So anything confusing? So I can never tell if no questions is good or bad. It may mean I put you all to sleep. Yeah. Uh, Mirna, was there a significant starvation in Germany between World War I and World War II? Uh, no, it took a wheelbarrow to buy a, a loaf of bread. In order to, you know, have you ever seen a picture of someone going to buy bread and all the money in the wheelbarrow? No, but there was deprivation. There, there definitely was starvation in Ukraine uh, in the early 1930s. And, and I spoke a little bit about the viscosity of Jewish identity, how Jews can be associated with capitalists or communists. But the, the Ukrainian famine actually uh, um, uh, encouraged anti-Semitism in Ukraine insofar as the Bolsheviks were associated as a Jewish party. And so Ukrainian nationalists, when they, you know, they saw tens, and th tens of thousands of their U Ukrainian uh, uh, you know, fellow citizens die, they blamed this on this party that they associated with Jewishness. Anything else? Yeah. The use of the word Holocaust is somewhat, uh, there's a dimensionality to it. You know, some say the Holocaust Situation in the atom bombing of Japan, 
in the in certain contemporary uh, wars and struggles, the use of the word Holocaust has come into play. Could you kind of parse that out, or you know, how do you view you? Is there a measure? Is, is it a comprehensive? Well, uh, let, me, let me say that there's Holocaust with the big H and Holocaust with a little H. And I think that Holocaust with a big H is a unique event in, in, in modern world history. Uh, this is suffering on an unprecedented scale. Uh, you know, the mechanized murder of millions and millions of people. Uh, I think to Myrna's credit, she's been very protective of, of the Holocaust as the central you know, genocidal event. Uh, and I've been to these meetings, and I've seen some of the pressure put on her to include uh, uh, other events uh, um, as, as Holocaust themselves. And, and, and I would uh, reject that. Uh, I don't know if that, that answers your question at all. Uh, other than to say, you know, there, there was something unique about what happened in Europe in the 1930s and 40s. If you don't mind, I would like to comment, and that is, um, although there have been, unfortunately, many genocides, <coughs> they, they call uh, the 20th century the genocidal century, and uh, unfortunately, genocide's going on right now. The measure... <coughs> The, the way in which we measure mass killing and mass death uh, in terms of its genocidal potential is against the Holocaust. And if we look to the Holocaust, we can see almost every element in a genocide was in the Holocaust. And as sociologists, we talk about the Holocaust being the ideal type of the Holocaust, unfortunately. And so, um, I do believe on some level it is unique in the intentionality of it um, beyond just mass killing and mass death. But I also think there's a tendency to, in comparing the Holocaust to other events that, I don't know, sometimes it strikes me that it lessens the Holocaust. And, and you know, different scholars have, have different political agendas, and, and, and I won't specify any, any events to which the Holocaust has been compared that I have found offensive, but, but it's not uncommon, uh, I think. And I think that it's a much more useful term to accept the capital H Holocaust and then to talk about genocide, which is unfortunately a very widespread um, tendency. Um, and you know, if we think about Rwanda, 800,000 people in a month with um, machetes is uh, staggering, absolutely staggering. Yeah, I wanted to add one more thing too, in its uniqueness, uh, the Holocaust, is that there are also so many philosophical, theological, and his, and his historical uh, 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 people who actually supported the Holocaust as an intellectual movement. Uh, universities like this one, uh, not like this one, but universities at that time with faculty composing text, uh, publishing in, in journals and reviews and creating an entire intellectual infrastructure for the annihilation of the Jewish people. And I think that's another reason also why it stands as a unique genocide. And the genocide that Myrna just said, all other genocides are compared to. But that the intellectual underpinnings are so crucial and rare, usually, in genocides.
prominent American scholar of the Holocaust and was one of the founding members of the museum in Washington, has written a book, or at least he's edited a series of articles about that. And it's, once again, everything about the Holocaust is not that straightforward. And he said, even though they had taken pictures of aerial photographs and they knew what was going on, that... Um, he challenges us to understand what we really know. What do we really know? And um, if you want to come by my office, I'll show you the book. It really does. Uh, it's, it's just not that straightforward. Nothing associated with the Holocaust is that straightforward. Okay, I think we're finished. I would like to thank... Steve Bittner for what I consider to be the most excellent hour and a half exposition of the history of the Holocaust.